This brings me to the time to uh, have the great honor to introduce our first speaker, and that is Lieutenant General Jerry Boynkin. And Well, it seems like there's nothing more that needs to be said. General? God bless you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It is uh, just so good to be back with you here in Costa Mesa at Calvary Chapel. We were with you in December, and we just uh, had a very blessed time. In fact, a few minutes ago when uh, these musicians were singing, I was absolutely sure the rapture was just about to occur. <laughs> it's just wonderful, and it's uh, such a tremendous honor to be in the pulpit of such a great, great man as Chuck Smith. So I'm, I'm deeply honored to be here. Uh, yes, give him a hand. Now, those of you who have heard me speak, and I know there are some in here, you know that I... After 36 and a half years in the United States Army, I always tell a Marine joke. <laughs> I can't help it. So what did they do tonight? They gave me a Marine as my escort. <laughs> yeah. So I prayed about it and I said, I'm going to tell a Marine joke anyhow. But let me tell you what happened. At the airport today, I rented a little Mustang. It's real hard for me to get in and out of. And when I finished the radio program this afternoon and I was getting in that Mustang, I ripped the seat out of my pants. <laughs> and I said to this Marine that was escorting me, I said, where can I get a pair of pants? And he said, I've got some duct tape. <laughs> I am not kidding you. I am standing before you tonight with duct tape that I got from a Marine. <laughs> so no Marine jokes tonight. You know, friends, I find it uh, very interesting that so many apologists, so many people who try to convince others of the reality of, uh, of God, go back and use scientific evidence to prove their point that there really is a God. And there are so many intricacies in our universe that could only be there because of intelligent design, because there's a creator. And it's overwhelming. It's enormous. I just listened to a a great scientist a few weeks ago in Oklahoma City explaining scientifically why there has to be a God. But ladies and gentlemen, I think that there is really a better way to explain that there has to be a God. And that is when we look at the nation of Israel. If you stop and think about it, it's more compelling evidence than the scientific evidence which can be argued. And the fact of the matter is, 2,500 years ago, the prophets, Ezekiel and Daniel and Jeremiah and Elijah and all the others, told us about this nation of people, these Jews, these Israelites, that they said would be conquered, they would be taken into captivity, they would then be scattered all over the earth. They would be treated with contempt. But one day, they would be called home, back to their homeland. And they went on to say that Jerusalem would be their capital 2,500 years ago. And now we all know that on the 14th of May of 1948, the nation of Israel was recreated. The Jews there declared sovereignty. They declared themselves to be an independent nation. And literally within hours, they were attacked by Arab nations all around them. And they were in the fight 
for survival only hours after they signed a declaration saying that they were an independent and sovereign nation. They fought outnumbered, but nonetheless, by God's grace and with God's angel of mercy over them, they defeated their enemies. And then they were attacked again several more times. They were attacked again in 1956, in 1967, in 1973, and then again in, 19, in 2006. And they continue to see a, a plethora of terrorist attacks that plague the nation today. But remember, the prophets said Jerusalem would become their capital. And in 1967, they retook the holy city. And once again, God's chosen people were able to go to the wall and pray to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We all know that Genesis 12, 3 tells us about the covenant and the promise that God made to Abraham when he said, those that curse you will be cursed, those that bless you will be blessed. But you know that was restated. The same thing was restated later in the 27th chapter of Genesis when Isaac was blessing Jacob, who stole his brother's birthright. And Isaac said this in the 27th chapter, Therefore God give thee of the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of corn and wine. Let people serve thee, the nations bow down to thee. Be Lord over thy brethren and let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. Cursed be every one that curseth thee and blessed be he. It blesseth thee. I think it's a pretty simple statement. Those who bless the nation of Israel will be blessed. And those who curse the nation of Israel will be cursed. Now as God brought all of this prophecy together. The Jews which really controlled essentially the greatest empire up to that point in the history of mankind, were defeated. They were taken into captivity. They were scattered. And then they were brought back to their homeland in 1940. How did God do all of that? And what role did America play in seeing God's prophecy unfold? How did God use the nation of America? And what role did the Jews play in our own nations? Well, let me say that, first of all, you need to re realize that the first immigration of Jews in this country was in 1654. It was 30 years before the first German immigration and 50 years before the Scots-Irish immigration into America. The Jews were here first, and they became great business leaders and entrepreneurs in this new nascent colony that was being established. And then during the Revolutionary War, the Jews fought. They were one of the few groups that were almost unanimous in their determination to declare independence and to see a new nation birthed on this continent. The Jews were great merchants, and history shows us that they ran the blockades, the British blockades. Jewish ships ran those blockades. Many of those Jewish merchants lost everything they had when their ships were sunk by the British, but others ran those blockades and brought critically needed supplies into America that helped to keep the Revolutionary Army, the Continental Army, going with food and ammunition and other types of supplies. And during the Revolutionary War, one of the most famous Jews in America was a man named Chaim Solomon. He was born in New York. And Solomon was a uh, broker and a financier and a merchant. And when George Washington pulled out of New York and headed for Philadelphia after essentially being defeated by the British there, Chaim Solomon volunteered to stay behind in New York 
to continue to provide information and intelligence 